We're doing a series of lessons on the life of Moses. We're into the second part of this. Uh, this syllabus we're calling Moses, the man of God. And you can obtain a copy of this syllabus for your own personal studies from the Living Faith Office. Just contact us and we'll help you to receive one. This particular lesson we're calling Why Leaders Die Young. Why Leaders Die Young. The truth is, many leaders die before their time. They die young because they don't know how to delegate authority. And they keep continuing to try to do their ministry today as they did it yesterday. That's what Moses is doing. Moses is killing himself and wearing out the people. Boy, what a description of so many growing churches. Good leaders, good pastors, but they make this mistake of failing to delegate authority. And so in Moses' life, it took his father-in-law to be able to show him the mistake that he was making, show him his era that you are trying to lead like you did before and you can't do that now. You've got to learn a new style of leadership. Let me break this lesson into three main parts. The first part, I'll talk about what I call a family reunion, a family reunion. Moses' father-in-law was a man by the name of Jethro. Jethro. He actually was a shepherd priest from the land of Midian. And this man, who was a leader in his own right, not only with his family, but also as a, a leader among his people, gave Moses some excellent advice. Moses had left his wife, her name was Zipporah, left her with her family when he went back to Egypt to deliver the Israelites from the hand of Pharaoh. He left her behind, and uh, now that he's coming through the wilderness with the liberated Israelites, Jethro hears about it and comes to meet Moses, bringing Zipporah and their two sons, uh, of Moses and Zipporah, brings their sons with her. So it's what I call a family reunion. It's a wonderful time for the families to reconnect. Moses begins to tell Jethro everything that God had done for them in the land of Egypt, how he had done so many signs and wonders and miracles for them. And when Jethro hears this, he, he makes this statement, Jehovah is greater than all the gods. And he's referring, of course, to the gods of Egypt. If you read this in the scripture text, it's found in the book of Exodus, the 18th chapter, verses 10 through 11. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods for in the thing in which they behave proudly, in other words, the thing they boasted that they could do for the Egyptians, he said, in the thing which they boasted, he was above them. Boy, those, those are powerful words. This is Jethro rejoicing in this testimony of Moses over the victory of Pharaoh and the slavery that they had been in for a long period of time in the land of Egypt. And so after he t shares all of this, they, they sit down and they eat a meal together. It says they ate before God. In other words, in the presence of God, it's almost like a memorial meal as they come together worshiping God and a family reunion. The second thing I would like to talk about in this lesson is what I will call a father's reasoning. A father's reasoning. The very next day, Moses goes back to work and Jethro, his father-in-law, goes to watch him as he is attending the needs of the people. And the scripture says in Exodus, the 18th chapter and verse 14, so when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit? 
and all the people stand before you from morning till evening. It didn't take long for Jethro to spot a big weakness in the leadership style of Moses. He recognizes that Moses is attempting to do the impossible. And so he asks him a very pertinent question. He says, why are you sitting alone? That's the key word there. Why are you sitting alone judging the people and taking care of their needs? And he gives him the counsel, the thing that you are doing is not good. Now, when your father tells you that what you're doing is not good, then you need to give some kind of explanation. And that's what Moses begins to do. Moses said, well, I, I'm helping to judge over their differences, over their difficulties, and I, I'm giving them advice and counsel what they need to do. Now, the question is, where did Moses learn this style of leadership? Where did he learn it? It's obvious. He learned it in Egypt, where Pharaoh sat above all the people. In fact, they even worshiped him as God. That's how high above the people Pharaoh sat. And Jethro says, I'm sorry, son. This thing is too much for you. I'm talking to some of you young pastors right now. God is blessing your ministry and, and he's doing wonderful things in your church, but I'm telling you, this thing is too much for you. You cannot do it alone. It was impossible for Moses to make all the decisions for nearly three million people that's out here in the wilderness with him, and he thinks he's going to be able to help them make all of their daily decisions, that is impossible. And so Jethro says to him, you will surely wear yourselves out. In other words, not just Moses, but also the people that's having to stand there all day long to try to get to talk to Moses and just before they get to the end of the line and get to talk to Moses, it's quitting time and he's got to go home and eat something. Oh, can you imagine? You will wear yourselves out. Now, here's the mistake that Moses is making. God has called Moses to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. That is his assignment, to be the leader of his people. But Moses instead has become the manager of their problems. Oh my, if you're not careful, that's a mistake that you will make. You, you, I, I remember a pastor telling me years ago that uh, his church was doing well, was growing, but the, the, as the church grew, his responsibilities as pastor grew. And he said, I soon found myself running continually, trying to meet the needs of the people. And he said, I was praying one day and God said, you're trying to minister to the wrong end of the sheep. I called you to feed them, not to clean up after their messes. See, that's what Moses is doing. He's become the manager of their problems. And so Jethro gives him some wise counsel here. Jethro said, this is what I would do, son. This is what you need to do. A, stand before God for the people. Boy, he got that right. There's nothing more important as a spiritual leader that you can do than to pray for your people. Stand before God for the people. You've got to pray for them, intercede for them. It, it, I think, is the number one assignment that we have. If, if we don't get this right, then we're probably not going to get anything else right because one of the most important things that you can do as a Christian, as a believer, is pray, pray. And as leaders, we must learn to pray for the people, pray for our church, pray for those that we are leading. Nothing we do is more important than prayer. And so Jethro correctly advises him, stand before God for the people. Second thing, point B, he says, teach them the statutes and laws. In other words, not only should we stand before God and pray for them, but 
Our second responsibility is, as spiritual leaders, is to teach our people the word of God. Teach them how to live their lives according to God's word. If, if they will learn to live their lives according to God's word, most of their problems will be solved. Most of their difficulties will go away because they're now living their lives according to God's word. God's word, that's what should be governing our lives and helping us with our daily decisions. And then point C, the third thing he tells them is, select from all the people able men. Now notice what he's saying here. Look for leaders. Look for people that can help you with this leadership. And so that's the third responsibility of spiritual leaders is to look among the people for those that have leadership qualities. Those that have the ability, all you need to do is train them, equip them, mentor them, and they can help you be able to lead the people. See, God does not want us doing this work alone. That's not good. Even Jesus didn't do that. He chose 12 that they might be with him. And then he says, he chose 70 that he might send them out before him. Notice that. Jesus did not work alone. He worked through the people that God had given him. He looks around and he chooses these that can help him do the work of ministry. Now, the spiritual qualifications that Jethro gives here is very good. If you're going to buy, find capable men and women, if you're going to find those that have leadership qualities, he said, for they such as fear God. What's he saying? He's saying they've got a proper attitude toward authority. If they do not have a good attitude toward authority, if they don't show respect for authority, don't choose them because they think they are God. They are the boss. They are the leader. No, no. The only kind of leadership that we need in the kingdom of God are servant leaders, those that are under authority. That's the way Jesus led. That is our example. So he said, these able men, look for those that fear God. Second thing, point B, he says, men of truth. In other words, they've got to love the truth. They've got to be people of integrity. What I've found is so many people are not people of integrity. They, they, they live divided lives. They are one thing in private, another thing publicly. Well, what a terrible distraction. What a, a terrible example. Because those that know them best trust them the least. They've got to be men of integrity. People that you can trust. That you know that what you see is what you get. They are the real deal. And then the third thing he says, point C, is hating covetousness. Now, what he's giving here is qualifications that you need to be looking for in these new leaders. What, what are they supposed to look like? This is what they're supposed to be like. They love God. They're under authority. They're people of truth. They hate covetousness. In other words, they must not be greedy. They must not be working for what they can get out of it, the money that they can get. And so he says, according to their abilities, select these men and put them over different groups, groups of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. What, what's he mean by that? Groups of ten. That, that, that's a small group. Anytime that you've got ten or less, you've got a small group. That's where you should begin with leadership. Never start with 100 or 1,000. Always start small. That's the beginning stage of leadership. And then if they're faithful with that, move them to the next level, which he called groups of 50. Groups of 50. What's happening here is someone has shown real leadership potential. They've done a good job with their small group, their group of 10. So move them to the next level, to the groups of 50, because they have proven 
to be a good leader. They've proven to be faithful. Now, again, don't reverse that. If you start with 50 and you see that that's too much, it's very difficult to ever move them back to 10. So start with 10, move to 50. Then he says, groups of 